offices. Okay, great. So we're just afternoon, so um, we will get started. So it is my pleasure to um, to welcome Dr. Jennifer Martin uh, to uh, give our seminar today. Um, Jennifer is with the uh, Meat Safety and Quality to, uh, up at the CSU. So she joined the faculty in about 2015. Um, after receiving her PhD in 2014 from Texas Tech University. Um, so a lot of uh, what Jennifer is focusing on is equality and safety. Um, so looking both at um, uh, the impact of microbials, and biochemicals on meat quality, uh, but also then the safety of our food. So how do we um, mitigate <coughs> Uh, foodborne pathogens from our food and also a big issue that we've been working with Jennifer on is around antimicrobials and we've had the pleasure at the Colorado Integrated Food Safety Center of Excellence on working with Jennifer on a project to better understand the use of antimicrobials among the uh, among veterinarians. So I've heard Jennifer speak on a number of times including uh, during some of my classes on foodborne disease epidemiology and she has a wonderful way of of being very succinct and, and really boiling down some uh, what is a very complex food system. Right, so I'm really looking forward to the presentation. And, uh. Thanks so much. Thanks, Elaine, for the introduction. First, I'll uh, preface my presentation with I move around a lot. So um, I try to make, I teach a lot of undergraduate classes, and undergraduates tend to have that ga glazed over look on their face after about five minutes. So. Uh, if I ask questions, I want this to be a conversation about agriculture, uh, food production, food safety, rather than me informing you all of a topic that, as Elaine alluded to, is very complex and very diverse. We talk about the complexities and system in which we produce food, and especially when we talk about agriculture. So uh, I'm a little biased. I grew up on a small agricultural operation in Texas, so I come from an agricultural background, but the majority of consumers in the United States do not have... Uh, an awareness of agriculture and its impact on our society and everyday life. So first, to start off today, I'm going to go over uh, an overview of agriculture. So does anyone in the class, or anyone in the room, not classroom, I won't assume you all are students, does anyone come from an agricultural background? Great, so we have a perfect audience to receive a lot of really good information about agriculture, but when most consumers in the United States think of agriculture, we think of a horse and a plow. Right? We think of this ancestral vision of how ag uh, was producing food for centuries prior to today. And in some places that's still true, but in today's society we have a lot of production agriculture that looks more like something you see on the right. So we're going to talk about a snapshot of ag in the U.S. and what changes we've seen in agriculture in the past 50 years to start us off. And that's really going to lend itself to conversations about food production and even if you allow your mind to stretch a bit leading into food safety and the role that this has played and some changes that we've seen relative to the safety of food. So when we talk about ag in the U.S. first, ag production is present in all 50 states. So we have a significant portion of Colorado, in fact, if you look, is dedicated towards agricultural production. The top five states in the U.S. that produce agricultural products and that could be anything from cotton used to make clothes or corn used to feed cows and pigs or corn that you consume or corn that you consume in other forms and fashions. California is the top uh, agricultural produ production state. Is anyone from California? That's interesting. Most of my students and the majority of my classes come from California. 11% of all agricultural products in the United States are produced in California. So it's a state that we look to a lot to be progressive in some of our societal concerns that we'll talk, especially as we get into food safety, but they're a strong agricultural state. Behind that, we have Iowa, Texas, Nebraska, our neighbors to the east, and Minnesota. But you can see agriculture is diverse. It's present in all 50 states, and the form in which it's, it takes place in those states varies. Uh, and that is what allows us in the U.S. to have a very diverse food supply, and we'll talk about that role here in a second. So if we start to look specifically uh, at some statistics regarding ag, uh, $992 billion of, is contributed to the gross domestic product via agriculture. So economically, it is one of the largest drivers of the U.S. economy. Uh, there are 11% or 11 of all jobs in the U.S., whether they're part-time or full-time jobs, 
are somewhat connected to agriculture. So coming from a small agricultural community, that's about 100%. Everyone in my hometown in some form or fashion is related to ag, but across the US, 11% of employment is associated with agriculture. Over half of the US land mass, so in the contiguous United States, over half of our available land is used for agriculture. So this is not something that's hidden away behind the scenes going on outside of the scope of what we see daily. Uh, it's ever present and globally, the US agriculture industry is, has $130 billion value. So we'll talk a bit later on today about the size of the industry. And it's really, really difficult to wrap your heads around the size of the industry from an economic perspective, from a, a, a global uh, financial perspective, uh, from the job market. And we're going to focus on a very small a portion of that today in food safety. But this plays a huge role uh, in some of the issues we'll talk about later on. So if we move to livestock production, so as Elaine mentioned, uh, in my day-to-day -day job, I focus a lot on meat quality and safety. In order to produce meat today in the U.S., uh, the definition of meat, which is a whole other conversation we won't get into today, we need animals. We need livestock to, to, to do that. So livestock encompass a significant portion of the U.S. agricultural industry. In the U.S., in 2017, we produced 150 billion pounds of meat animals. 150 billion pounds of meat animals were produced in the US. Uh, that worth or the value of those products that were produced in those meat animals exceeds 100 billion. And that number is going to continue to grow as we move forward uh, in the US. The animal products account for 51% of all agricultural value. So of all of the products that come from ag, whether that's cotton for clothes, meat for consumption, uh, fat that may be used for soap making or cosmetics, 51% comes from animal products. So economically, a significant portion of uh, the value in agriculture is associated with livestock. 41% of the contiguous US is used to feed livestock. So we said just a second ago that 50% of the land available, the land mass in the, the contiguous United States, is used for agricultural production. 41% of land in the US is used to feed livestock. So if you go 15 minutes outside of Denver, or outside of Aurora, you will find corn being grown to feed cattle that are 30 minutes north of town. So it is impossible to escape the impact of this industry in the United States. Uh, so much so that if we look at some of the statistics about livestock production, if we move to cattle, the United States is the primary or largest producer of cattle in the world. Just to set you up the heat map there on the right-hand side, the really dark red, those are concentrated areas of animals. And in those areas, we have more than 20 animals per 200 acres. So if you look in Colorado specifically, right around this region, directly north of Denver, we produce a lot of cattle. The majority of cattle in the United States are produced in the central US. We do see an increasing number of cattle produced in the western United States. And we'll talk a bit later on about some interesting scenarios that arise from food safety due to the, the concentration of cattle in California and Arizona, especially when we think about the types of food that we consume in the US. So largest producer of cattle, because the United States citizens uh, generally like to consume beef, we also import a lot of beef. So we can't keep up with the demand for beef in the US, so we're having to import it from other countries. We're the largest importer of beef and the second largest exporter. And currently, the primary, uh, per, the primary country that is purchasing a lot of U.S. beef is South America and Argentina. So in January of this year, there were 94.4 million cows in the U.S. So it's funny, I tell a story about myself. Again, I grew up in a really small town in Texas. Uh, my high school had 94 students, K through 12. Right outside of my high school was a pasture with 250 cows. So there were more cattle in my town than there were people. And that's a, a problem, not a problem. That's an issue that is present across a lot of places in the United States. If we move on to dairy cows, Colorado is increasing in their presence in the dairy industry in the US. The majority of dairy production, though, occurs in California. So we've all seen the commercials probably of happy cows come from California. They do come from Colorado as well. We produce happy cows in Colorado. 
A lot of uh, dairy cows are also concentrated uh, in the uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota region, where the, second, or the dairy industry is the second largest industry from an agricultural perspective in the United States. If we shift on to pigs, an interesting thing about Colorado, we have very few pigs in Colorado. The majority of pigs in the US are raised in the Midwest and in the very, very Southeast, especially in the states of North Carolina uh, and South Carolina. So we're the second largest pork producer in the world. We're second to China in pork production and second in pork consumption as well. Just last or two months ago, there were 76 million pigs on feed in the US. And that's a stagnant number. That number is going to stay right around 76 million for the duration of the year. So at any given day in this year, we'll find around 76 million pigs in the US. If we switch to sheep production, uh, Colorado is the, the largest producing state in the United States relative to sheep production. So we produce a lot of sheep just north of here. In Fort Collins, around the Fort Collins area in Larimer County, there are over 100,000 sheep at any given point in time. So a lot of lambs and a lot of sheep meat is produced in the state of Colorado, as well as the state of Texas. Uh, if we move to chickens, the most globally consumed protein, we produce a lot of chickens in the United States. Uh, in 2017, 60 billion pounds of chicken were produced. That number to me is mind boggling. 60 billion pounds of poultry were produced in the US. We produced over 106 billion eggs. It is one of the fastest growing industries in the United States and in the world. And if we talk a bit about food safety, this is one of the most problematic industries across the world and in the United States. So a really rapid growing industry, one that is burgeoning at the seams. We cannot produce enough poultry in the US. And at the same time, from a food safety perspective, we can't get ahead of it. And we'll talk about the impact of that situation as we move forward today. So changes in US agriculture. That's just an overview of what production of animal products and meat specifically looks like in the US. Ag is present in all 50 states. When we started off today, we said that 50 years ago or 70 years ago, if you will, ag looked very ancestral, right? We had farmers in the field. They were picking by hand uh, cotton. They were picking corn. They were harvesting their own animals. If I think to how my grandparents and great grandparents raised animals for their own consumption, it differs very much from how we raise animals for consumption today. So ag looks very different today than it did 50 years ago. And we've seen quite a few trends going on in agriculture. The biggest one that is noticed across the board is farm size continues to increase. So farms are getting bigger. They're getting bigger because Americans demand agricultural products. We consume a lot of meat. We wear a lot of cotton. We consume a lot of grains, a lot of cheese, milk, eggs. Our demand for agricultural products is going up, so farm sizes are growing, going up. As the farm size goes up, the number of farms in the US continues to go down. So no longer do we have a majority of small family farms. We have a larger majority of big size, commercial size farms. The net farm income is decreasing. And this is probably one of the most impactful uh, changes that we've seen in the past 50 years. 50 years ago, farmers were able to rely on their production of agricultural products for their income, their sole source of income. That cannot happen today. So we have farmers or producers of livestock, producers of meat products, who have to rely on outside or off the farm income to make it in today's world. And so that challenge, that stress, now we have farmers who can no longer put their primary effort into their farm enterprise. Instead, they have a job off the farm. And that's changing the way in which they handle and manage their farm operation, right? So when that comes to food safety, we'll touch back on that here in a second. And this societal changes that are impacting the ways in which we produce safe food. The average age of farmers in the U.S. is increasing. Does anyone know why that is? Why are farmers getting older? My dad is getting older. He'll tell me he's not, but he is. <laughs> but why is the average age of farmers in the U.S. continuing to go up? Young people are not going into Young people are not going into agricultural production. 
So young people are not going back to the farm to produce livestock the way their parents or their grandparents did. One, because economically it's very expensive. Land is expensive. The capital equipment is expensive. There's not a lot of incentive or motivation to go into an agricultural community and produce food, especially when you know you're going to have to have a second job to sustain yourself. So we're seeing farmers increase in age. And we'll again come back to how that societal shift has an impact on food production and food safety as we move forward. By far, though, the biggest driver of change in agriculture has been technology. So we'll show you a slide here in a second that just really depicts the impact of technology in the cattle system particularly. But today, as, a, as that statistic tells you, we, we use 25% less farmland and 78% less labor than we did in 1948. And we produce three times the amount of food. So 25% less farmland, 78% less labor. We have a population that continues to demand these products and a globe that continues to demand products that are produced in the US. And the only way that is possible is with technology. So we'll talk here in a second about what the lack of technology would mean. Uh, in 1930s, a farmer could produce 100 bushels of corn in one day, so a nine hour workday. Uh, today, a farmer can harvest 1,000 bushels of corn in an hour. And this need for technology, again, is not just because it's more profitable for the farmer. We just said that it's not profitable for most farmers. The need for technology to transition agricultural enterprises and operations is because we demand those products. Now, that's an interesting conundrum, right? Because we think about in agriculture, there is a need for technology. But do most consumers consider technology a good thing in ag? Think about conversations that you may have around the dinner table or conversations that you may have with colleagues or friends about technology when it comes to producing your food. Today, it is not viewed very well in, in general consumer society. Most consumers want to see food that is produced without technology. So we would rather know that the food that we can buy at our local grocery store was produced without a GMO, or maybe without a pesticide, or without a growth hormone, without an implant, without the technology that it, we've seen over time is necessary to meet our demand for products. So if we were to eliminate technologies just from the beef industry, if we were to eliminate a feed producer or a feed agent that allows animals to get bigger faster, with less feed, we call them beta agonists. That's a whole other conversation, a whole other discussion. We would require three and a half million more cattle in the US. If we were to eliminate growth implants, so hormones that allow animals to get larger, faster, require less feed to get bigger, we would require 9.9 .9 billion more animals in the US. If we were to eliminate both of those, we would need 15 million more cattle. Cattle, cattle, that's not a word. Cattle in the United States. So 15 million more cattle in the US. Currently there are 94 million head of cattle in the US. And we've maxed out all available land. So without technology, we cannot do this. And that's a critical concept to wrap our heads around because technology is necessary to meet our demand. If tomorrow the United States said we are no longer going to consume or purchase products from animals, then we could do this. We could produce food without technology. But because we demand agricultural products, we must utilize available technologies in the agricultural sector. And that's changed how we approach food safety, as we'll learn here in a second. So ag has changed in the past 50 years. But the goals of agriculture have not changed. We still, as agriculturalists, try to produce safe, high quality and affordable agricultural products. We're gonna focus on the safety here in a second. We still want to maintain and be good stewards of the land and the animals. And that's a theme that you will find present in every farming operation across the US, as well as enhance the sustainability of the operation. It's a very real fact that if we do not enhance sustainability of agriculture, soon we won't have enough water, we won't have any more available land, and we're going to be faced in a situation where our demand hasn't changed, but our technology has gone. And our ability to produce at this level has gone away. 
So we're going to shift gears for a second into food production. I think it's important in any conversation about food production to have an understanding of agriculture. And I think it's an understanding that the majority of consumers aren't really aware of the size and scope and capacity and changes that we've seen in domestic agriculture in the past 50 years. So food production. Uh, the U.S. is producing more food than ever before. We're also eating more food than ever before. We'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, food production is more efficient than we ever have been. So just like we mentioned, we can produce more food with less. That theme of producing more with less technology, maximizing the system, we'll come back to that as we venture into food safety. Uh, one thing that's interesting, I think, despite fluctuations in costs, so we've said farmers are less profitable today. They're having to use off-farm jobs to maintain a source of income. So their costs are going up, equipment is getting more expensive, getting more expensive, resources are getting more expensive, water is expensive, land is expensive, but most of us can go to the grocery store and we can still afford our food, right? The majority of consumers in the U.S. can afford food. Retail prices have maintained relative stability despite fluctuations in land, water, and resource costs. The U.S. is in a really unique position in that we spend very little of our disposable income on food. We'll look at some statistics compared to other countries around the globe here in a second. Of the money that you spend on food, so every dollar that you spend as a consumer of food, 10 cents goes back to the farmer. That number continues to go down. So we consume more, we're producing more, we're producing more with less. Farmers are spending more to produce more but their profit goes down. And the reason why the profit goes down is because food now has labor costs associated with it. We have regulatory agencies that regulate the way in which we produce food. We have grocery stores that have overhead costs. We have restaurants that have overhead costs and labor. So all of the extra is what makes up your food costs. That's why you can go to the grocery store day after day and pay roughly the same amount for a loaf of bread or a box of cereal or a package of cheese. So those prices, retail prices, don't fluctuate very much. We are able to maintain some stability. What does that mean for agriculture? What do you think it means? We still demand food that is high quality, food that is convenient, and it's costing more to produce it. And the people producing it are getting less money for their production. So we have this really interesting dichotomy in food production in the U.S. and it's expensive to produce and our demands for the food that we consume continue to go up. We'll talk about that here in just a second, but it's, just think about uh, the dynamic nature of food in the U.S. and all of the requirements that we want for the food that we produce in a very, very, very small and declining fraction of that actually goes to the people who are producing it. And we put a lot into their uh, efforts. Okay, food expenditures in the U.S., $1.3 trillion every year. We spend a lot on food. Relative to the rest of the globe, though, we spend less than 13% of our disposable income on food. And that varies depending on your income class. If you increase in income, you're going to spend more on food. You're going to spend or purchase food that is more expensive than if you're in a lower income bracket. And that differs compared to other countries, especially if we look in sub-Saharan Africa, this goes up to above 70% of disposable income is spent on food. So we have an industry in the U.S. that we just talked about that produces food very easily and efficiently, more of it than ever, and that's why Americans can rely on spending less than 13% of their income on food. Uh, we spend of that, one-third of our income is spent on eating out. So how many of you have eaten out in the past week? Majority of consumers eat out at least three times per week. We spend a lot of money outside of our home. And that number continues to go up as we move on. Uh, we're consuming an, a, an increasing number of imported products. So think about maybe your first meal experience. The first time that you remember going to the grocery store and buying food. Right? You may have purchased a gallon of milk, a loaf of bread, some cheese. And our thought was, it's all coming from somewhere close by. It's all coming from the U.S. But then today, when we go to the, the grocery store, 
I can buy meat from Europe. I can buy bread from Italy. I can buy coffee from South America. I can buy cheese from Italy. Our food is global today. And in the US, the average food, whatever makes it to your plate, has traveled 1,500 miles to get there. Think about that, 1,500 miles for the corn that is on your plate to reach your plate, or for the strawberry that you consume, or the banana that comes from South Africa. So now we have an expectation as a consumer in the US that I can buy bananas year round. How many bananas do we produce in Colorado? Zero. <laughs> especially right now in the winter. But I have an expectation. I'm really upset if I go to the grocery store and they don't have bananas. I'm going to be mad. We have an expectation of having a global food supply year-round. And that's an expectation that has to be met in the U.S. food industry. One of the biggest trends that we've seen uh, in the past 50 years in food consumption has been the desire for convenience. And it's interesting. It's, this is present in a lot of different industries. If you go back and look at cars in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. The seat design was different. And I, when I first learned this, I was like, why in the world would seat design have something to do with the food industry? But now Americans consume food in their cars. So now we have cup holders in our cars. We have seats that are easy to clean. Especially if you have kids, that's a necessity to have seats that are easy to clean. Because we desire food that is convenient. I want to be able to swing through a drive through on my way back to Fort Collins, have dinner when I go. And I want to be able to go to a grocery store at 2 a.m. in the morning when I'm finished with work for the day, it seems, and buy breakfast that I will prepare the next morning. We want food that is convenient, around the clock, easy to access. And that desire for convenience has been one of the biggest drivers of change that we've seen in the U.S. food industry in the past uh, 20 years for sure, perhaps even more than that. The increased desire for convenience has also changed the way that we consume food, the way that we purchase food, and the way that we produce it. Because now a consumer wants access to food 24 hours a day. 50 years ago, my great-grandmother knew that if she wanted to purchase meat, the butcher was open from the hours of 2 to 5, three days a week. And she would prepare a menu, go and purchase meat for whatever dinner, whatever option she was having, whether it was lunch or dinner or breakfast, and that would have to last two or three days. Now, if I wanted to, it would be pure torture. I could go to the grocery store every day of the week and never decide a menu item until I saw it in the grocery store because we demand easy and convenient and 24-hour access to food. So because Americans want convenient food, we also eat it more often. And we eat food that may be not be the healthiest for us. So one thing that we've seen that coincides with convenience is decreased health. So today, Americans consume 25% more calories per day than we did in the 1970s. What do you think is also happening? If you look here on this uh, right-hand side, we see the blue bars we consume at or above the recommendation or below the limit. We consume a lot of fats, a lot of oils, a lot of carbs, a lot of meat in the U.S. The one that continues to decrease is vegetables. If you look at this figure for the past 20 years, never do Americans consume too many vegetables. That hasn't changed. So we consume for food more frequently. The food that is demanded to be convenient, maybe not the healthiest for us. But what do you think has also happened in the past 20 years as we've consumed more carbohydrates, fats, oils, protein, meat? We've seen a rapid increase in obesity rates. So we try to look at the food industry in the U.S. A lot of people point fingers at what, what has driven the rise in obesity in the U.S. And by far... The most tangible relationship that we can see in the U.S. food industry in relation to obesity rate increases is convenience. The desire for convenient food began around the 1950s and 60s, and this is where we start to see obesity rates increase. Okay? So food consumption trends in the last 20 years, defining, if you will, the millennial generation. Consumers still demand convenient food. 
We want to purchase food 24 hours a day, whether it's in a delivery service or restaurants, a retail grocery store, uh, a club superstore, if you will. But we also see now an increased awareness of health. So if you go to the grocery store, we have health food aisles. Consumers are reading nutrition labels. We have food that is marketed to be more healthy than another brand of food or another type of food. So 62% or 63% of American consumers say they eat healthy most of the time. Probably not that accurate. <laughs> they probably say they eat healthy, but if we actually kept a food diary, we would see that it's much less than that. They not only say they eat healthy, they're willing to pay more for food that will help them maintain some health status. Whether that's low carb, high protein, low fat, low sodium, low sugar, they're willing to pay for food that has that on the label. That differs from 20 years ago. 20 years ago, bread was bread. It was either white bread or wheat bread or sourdough bread or rye bread, but now I can get low sodium bread, low fat bread, sugar free bread, low calorie bread because consumers are willing to pay more for food that is healthy. Uh, we see an increase, uh, increasing number of concerns for the production method or use of technology. And this has really been present in the past 10 to 15 years. So consumers are willing to pay more for food that is organic, natural, GMO-free, pesticide-free, certified humane, welfare-friendly, free-range, all of these production claims that really don't necessarily have an impact on the nutritional status of the food, but they make me as the consumer and purchaser of that food more comfortable with the way the food was produced. So consumers care in the past 20 years about how their food is produced. We also see consumers who want a diet that is global. So I want to be able to buy cheese from Italy, bread from France, coffee from South America, but I also, at the same time that I want a global diet, I want to buy local. And I want to be able to go to the farmer's market and buy vegetables that were raised down the road and meat that was raised in Colorado and milk that came from a farmer or a dairy cow in Colorado. So now imagine being responsible for producing that type of food, global and local, meeting all of the production criteria in the US, healthy, convenient, safe, affordable, fast, good quality. It's a monumental challenge when it comes to food production in the US. So these are some production claims that you, uh, US consumers have indicated are important to them and they're willing to pay for. So if we look, we have consumers who are willing to pay for food that is raised in a natural production system. So whether that's without the use of hormones, Without the use of preservatives, antibiotics, it qualifies as natural or it's clean label. Over a half of consumers indicate they would be willing to pay more for food meeting those production criteria. Food that is raised without, uh, or without animals in cages, so cage-free, without antibiotics, uh, with uh, maybe locally produced or fair trade sourced. 30 years ago, fair trade source, fair trade source was not a label claim. And even today, we see some difficulty in verifying the label claims. So if we keep going on, we see food, uh, less consumers are willing to, willing to pay for food that meets an alternative lifestyle. So maybe it's gluten-free or plant-based or vegetarian, vegan and paleo. So by far, when it comes to our willingness to pay for different types of food, we are willing as a consumer base in the US to pay more for food that meets production-based claims or societal-based claims. Nothing related to the health or nutrition status of the food. So most consumers are willing to pay more for food that has no preservatives than they are for food that is vegetarian. Okay. Other things that we've seen in the US uh, we're willing to spend more for food as our income increases. That differs from a lot of other countries. And that's the reason why it differs, because in the U.S., the small, very, very small portion of our disposable income goes towards food. We're willing to, again, pay a premium for food that is healthy, meeting production criteria, high quality. As my income level increases, I demand a food that is of a higher quality than before. And this makes sense to most consumers in the U.S. When you're in college as an undergrad, ramen is a delicacy, right? You can make ramen taste fantastic. But once you get your first well-paying job, 
all of a sudden you settle for nothing less than prime beef. Or you want to go to the nicest restaurants. That's tangible, that's something we can wrap our heads around. As our income increases, we're willing to pay more for food, and we're willing to pay more for food that is healthy, that meets production criteria, that is high quality, satisfies a special request or a special need. But in America, are we willing to pay more for food that is safe? None of these things above have anything to do with safety. Okay? Food that is produced in a vegetarian-friendly fashion is no more safe than food that is produced not vegetarian-friendly. Or food that is produced without pesticides is no more safe than food that is produced with pesticides. But in the U.S., do you think U.S. consumers are willing to pay more for food that is safe? What do we view safety as in the U.S.? First, let's see, we're not going to do the poll, so ignore this. We're just going to have a conversation really quickly. What does safe food mean to you? I ask this in every food safety class or every lecture or talk that I give about food safety. What does food safety mean to you? And I'll stare at you <laughs> until you answer, just like I do my students. What does food safety mean? You won't get sick. From won't get it. sick, right? Does it mean something different to anyone else? Generally, we consider food to be safe when it will not make us ill, or it contains no harmful substances, right? Whether that's a pathogen, a pesticide, an allergen, whatever that may be. So that's generally the impression that we have, and we can all agree on that's our baseline for food safety. But when we ask most consumers in the U.S. what safe food or what image they think of when they think of food safety in the U.S., they think of this. So this is a Google image search and a Google news search for food safety three days ago for some of it, and some of it's a bit older from some other talks I've given. We're concerned as a nation about the safety of our food. Should we be? That's another interesting question. We may not have enough time for that question today. But we have consumers who are scared of maybe superbugs inside of their meat or inside of their grocery bag. Or they're concerned about resistant bacteria that they get exposure to via agricultural products in general. Or they're concerned about E. coli, salmonella, listeria, campylobacter. Most consumers do feel some level of hesitation when it comes to safety of their food. And it's something that we continue to see. The most recent recall actually affected a, JB, or a JBS, which is a company in Colorado, uh, millions of pounds of beef were recalled due to salmonella contamination. Just a couple of months ago, or maybe just a month ago now, we had a recall out of Fort Morgan for E. coli. So it still happens today where we still have issues related to safety of food. Um, but in the U.S., consumers expect their food to be safe. So when I ask this to my undergraduate class, what do you, are you concerned about the safety of your food? Most of them aren't. Most consumers either have some level of concern that seems to be heightened, especially around times of recalls that we're seeing right now, or most consumers just expect the food they purchase at the grocery store to be safe. And they expect the food they purchase at a restaurant to be safe. So some things that we've seen in the U.S. food safety industry in 1993, the one thing that perhaps revolutionized the entire industry, literally overnight things changed. Due to, an outbreak of, uh, due to an outbreak of E. coli 0157H7 from undercooked hamburgers in the Pacific Northwest, today you still know, most of you hopefully, what company, what fast food chain was associated with this. And the reason why, it wasn't the first outbreak. People have gotten sick from their food before. This is not new. But the reason this caused the meat industry to change their perspective about pathogens in, food, in the meat industry was because children died. Four children lost their lives due to the E. coli outbreak. It was massive, multi-state. And overnight, the beef industry specifically said, we have a problem. And it's really, really interesting to talk to people who were involved in the plant responsible for producing the meat that was contaminated. To this day, they have nightmares about this outbreak. and The fact that four small children lost their lives. And it's, it's shocking to say to some, and it's sort of 
uh, controversial, but it caused the meat industry to wake up and realize that we're producing a food going into commerce that consumers expect to be safe. I do not want to walk into a restaurant in Denver and be concerned of, will this food kill me? And this was the first time that overnight news articles came out. It was uh, on headlines across the country. Hamburgers killed kids. And it happened. So it revolutionized the industry. Billions of dollars we'll talk about here in a second when, went into it. In 1996, the U.S. passed the Pathogen, Re Pathogen Reduction Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point Regulation, or the HACCP Regulation. Now food safety was no longer the responsibility of the farmer or the producer, it was regulated by the government. So they invested uh, $380 million per year in overnight $930 million in capital equipment or long-term investments to improve the safety of meat and poultry produced in the U.S. So if we're looking at $380 million per year, $930 million long-term investments, billions of dollars have been spent to improve the safety of food in the U.S. Are you willing to pay more for it? Do you pay more for it? In the U.S. today, we pay about two cents per pound for safe meat. So I, last night I was sitting at dinner with some friends and I was like, would you pay more for meat that is safe? Would you pay five cents more? Would you pay a dollar more? Would you pay five dollars more? And in reality, the production of safe meat, specifically in the U.S., costs us about two cents per pound. It saves $1.9 billion in health care and associated costs. So are you willing to pay two cents more per pound for food that is safe? That's the right answer. Yes, you are willing to pay two cents more per pound for food that is safe. Are we willing to pay five cents more per pound? Five dollars more per pound? We start to get a little questionable when we... <laughs> gets a $5 more per pound. So food safety in a complex system, this is a systems map of the food industry. It's complicated. And we just said consumers there in the middle, we want food that is affordable, safe, convenient, high quality, uh, local, global, all of these things. And then it's also regulated by the government. And there are farmers involved. There are finances involved. How can we produce food that is affordable, convenient, local, global, natural, organic, diverse? So I don't want to eat chicken and vegetables every night. I want a, a palate that is more diverse than that. High quality or it tastes good, healthy and safe. It's a huge problem. When you have a farmer that is increasing in age, their profit is decreasing. They're no longer able to maintain profitability producing this type of food. But you and myself as a consumer, I still demand it. And that's the state of agriculture and food production today. When we have a very interesting dynamic on the production side that is driven by technology and driven by the consumer, and this is what the consumer demands. And at the end, I'm willing to pay more for all of those things up top, but I'm not willing to pay more for food that is safe. I expect it to be safe. And food safety, even though it costs us two cents per pound, it costs the industry billions every year to produce food that is safe. So with that, some challenges just to wrap up here uh, that we are seeing currently um, I'm going to open this up to a conversation from you all here in a second. Uh, that we are working on currently, we continue to see increases in interest in, um, from either academicians or across the industry itself. The biggest one right now is antimicrobial resistance. So a lot of consumers in the U.S. think that their meat contains superbugs, or bugs that are resistant to antibiotics. And there has been a significant interest across the industry to reduce the use of antimicrobials in food production. And a lot of consumers think that the reduction of antimicrobials in food production will eliminate this problem. It is not. I wish it were that simple. 
Uh, eliminating antimicrobials in food production does not eliminate antimicrobial resistant bacteria. We're able to actually go into the permafrost and find bacteria that are resistant to drugs used today. So we are working on some solutions and some efforts to reduce the presence, but the reality is eliminating their use and eliminating the presence of antimicrobial resistant bacteria is pretty impossible, at least at this stage. Uh, some other challenges from a food safety perspective, the methodology that is used. And it's a really, really interesting conversation uh, to talk about food safety methodology because the conversation varies whether I'm in an academic circle, if I'm in a public health circle, if I'm talking with those in the industry, or I'm talking with clinicians who are actually having to treat foodborne illnesses. It's a different conversation in every entity. So when it comes to clinicians, they have a desire for increased diagnostics. I want to know quicker what bacteria I'm working with. And that's across human health, animal health, everything. If we knew what bacteria we were working with, we could more judiciously prescribe an antimicrobial to treat it, right? So FAST, that theme is present across the industry. Uh, we're seeing a really rising increase in interest in whole genome sequencing. So when I'm talking to public health agents and clinicians, this is fantastic. When I go and talk to people in the industry or farmers, this terrifies them. So I had a conversation about three weeks ago with a company that was sort of dabbling in the waters of whole genome sequencing. And that conversation lasted about 15 minutes <laughs> before they decided that if a person or a government agency has a genome sequence from a bacteria that is specific to my plants, then all of a sudden we have a very linear relationship between a patient who is ill and my specific plant. And from a public health perspective, that's fantastic. That's the gold mine, right? But if I'm the producer, I don't want to be the person whose finger, the finger is pointing at me. So today, because of some of the legal issues related to uh, food safety regulation and ownership, uh, we're seeing this getting some pushback from industry. With that, I think leading into that really well, when we think about whole genome sequencing specifically, it's a lot of data. And how many of you know how to interpret whole genome sequencing data? How many farmers do you think know how to interpret it? How many meat industry plant workers in Greeley, Colorado, do you think know how to interpret it? They don't. And so it's scary because we're able to produce a lot of data and a lot of data that we really don't yet know what it means and we don't know how to use it. And that's concerning for the food industry. Not only is it concerning because we don't know how to use it, we don't have the skill set in the current industry to actually analyze it. So it's fascinating for me as a new faculty member at CSU, I have graduate students who came in thinking they were going to do culture-based food safety. I want to learn how to plate salmonella and that's all I came for. And now they're experts in bioinformatics because that is the direction in which the food safety industry is going. It's no longer being able to look at a plate and see if it's salmonella or E. coli. It's being able to interpret large volumes of data and synthesize data to not only have impactful meaning, but also no regulatory implications of those results. So it's a really dynamic field that's changing the, or changing the way that we look at food safety in the industry. Uh, that's not methodology, it's a global food industry. So we have a set of global standards in the, or standards in the US for food safety, but we get food quite frequently from China, from Brazil, from Canada, from the EU, from the Middle East. Their food safety systems are very different. Likewise, we export a lot of food to those countries that may have more stringent food safety systems than our own. So one of the ones that's really driving the U.S. food industry is residues. Whether they're drug residues or antimicrobial residues, we have relatively low standards. China has even lower standards. So we're having now to address the way in which we produce food to meet the qualifications and regulations for other countries. Uh, it's more than pathogens. Does anyone know what the number one cause of recalls is in meat specifically in the US? Allergens. So more food, more meat specifically is recalled in the US due to allergens than any other thing or pathogens specifically. The last thing that we'll kind of uh, end on, uh, the consumer 
is the biggest challenge to food safety moving forward. And you know, it's kind of a necessary challenge, right? Consumers are needed to consume the food. But they also have, like we've alluded to so far, really, really diverse and often difficult to meet qualifications for the food they consume, right? And then especially one that I'll kind of end on that to me highlights uh, this challenge from a consumer's perspective. So everyone's familiar with E. coli 015787. Hopefully it's a bad bacteria. We don't like it in the meat industry, but it's there. And it's really uh, more common in ground meat versus whole muscle meat. And that's a lecture for a different day as to why that is. And in 1993, like we mentioned before, we had an outbreak of E. coli 015787 due to undercooked hamburgers that killed four children in the Pacific Northwest. For 10 years after that, consumers were very leery of their ground beef. Now 60% of consumers in the U.S. consume undercooked hamburgers. So I want food that is cheap or affordable, that is high quality, tastes good. I want it to be global and local and natural and organic and all of the things that we've talked about, but I'm not willing to pay for safety. And in some cases, my expectation for safety supersedes what we know about the food industry. And the reason why most consumers in this poll that just came out, or this uh, research paper that just came out a few months ago, the reason why most consumers said they're willing to consume undercooked hamburgers is because they read it on the blog. They saw a food chef on TV cook a hamburger patty to an undercooked temperature. And if that person does it, then I can do it, right? So we have consumers that are trusting more what they read in popular press and social media than they do the actual science or the own benefit of history. In 1993, not that long ago, undercooked hamburgers actually caused people to lose their lives. And we seem to have forgotten that as a society. So I'll end with asking you guys a question. What do you think is the primary or largest food safety challenge of the next generation. We've talked about antimicrobial resistance. We've talked about a global palate, methodology. It's not just pathogens. There are allergens, the consumer. But what's going to be the thing that revolutionizes the food industry again and will define food safety and what food safety looks like 20 years from now? Anyone? What is food safety? What food safety challenge are you concerned with as we wrap up with time? Global warming. Global warming, yeah, how it's produced. Greenhouse gases and the role of ag in food production. That's a huge challenge. And one that, again, if we uh, eliminate technology, the impact of global warming goes up. We produce more greenhouse gases because we need more animals. So it's one that's not going to go away. The way in which we produce food, because now we care about how we produce food. Anyone else? Yeah, distribution and sustainability as the population continues to grow. So while food safety is important and antimicrobial resistance is important, it's also we're producing so much right, right? at such a high level. When are we going to um, start to, to plan for sustainable yeah, that's a good, so it's an interesting conversation to have in the meat industry because generally our, our argument is we'll use technologies and continue to produce more and produce more and produce more to feed this feeding the nine or feeding the 11, whatever the number is you want to use. But at some point in time, is our consumption of the food requiring that much natural resources not sustainable anymore? So rather than focusing on producing more and more meat, should we as a society consume less meat? That's a conversation that's very polarizing in the meat industry, as you might expect. But realistically, as we look towards sustainability, perhaps meat production isn't the most sustainable. And should we look at alternative ways to increase sustainability? Great and, point, though. And from a health perspective. From a health perspective, too, the direction right. direction we need to go from a bigger safety view. You right. Know, if you think about health. Right. As a safety issue. Right, exactly. Yeah. Is our current dietary pattern in the U.S. and our desire for food that meets all of these criteria the most helpful? Perhaps not. 
And I think if we look at a lot of uh, other countries around the globe, we would see that it's definitely not the way to be sustainable and produce a healthful population. You all have the glazed over look on your face now, <laughs> which means my time is up. <laughs> Thanks all for your attention and for the invitation to come and speak uh, today. A, a little bit about agriculture and food production and some of the dynamics of uh, the desire and necessity to produce safe, high quality and affordable food and just how complicated it is in the U.S. So thanks. Great. I think we're just at one, so we probably don't have enough time for questions, but I'm sure Jennifer will stay around if anybody has anything they want to ask. Great. Thank you.